Welcome to the Roost News. I am Lillian Lee, co-lead for the Roost News. And I am Judy Baroni, co-lead for the Roost News. Thank you for tuning in to the Roost News podcast, the place for all things volunteer. Today we have three BSGs, very special guests, and they all are employed or work with AARP. We are especially excited to have them today because it is Women's History Month. And what women better to interview Kathy Kynes, Tara Schaefer, and Christine Anastasio. And ladies, before we start talking about your job role, we want you to share a little bit about you. How long have you been working with AARP? What is your best memory or why did you even decide to work for AARP? And where is your office located? We'll start with Kathy, then Christina, and then Tara. Kathy is going to come off mute in just a second. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Lillian. My name is Kathy Kynes. I live in Maryland, and I work in the Washington, D.C. office of AARP. I wandered through those doors over 20 years ago as an intern in our field, one of our field offices. So my, I've always felt like the uh, field offices were home and that the volunteers were the family that we, uh, that we all not only love, but also work for. <laughs> so that's my, my grounding in ARP. I'll sneak in and say my best friend benefit is I met my husband at ARP against my father's best wishes. <laughs> And uh, 30 years later, I think that worked out okay. So uh, I uh, forgot your third question. That's where I live, that's where I work. Oh, why did I come to ARP? Yes, why? Uh, I, ha I was getting a degree in gerontology at the time and have always just felt like people with gray hair were people I related to. And then I became one of them, luckily. Um, but it's just always been a, a, a group that I felt I connected to. So I was very excited to get a job in the field and here in the best place in the world. Thank you. Thank you. I think I'm up next, yes. Lillian. Beautiful. So I have been with ARP for five years. Um, I started with our Office of Volunteer Engagement just about a year, coming up on my one-year anniversary. Um, but prior to that, I was the Associate State Director of Outreach in New Jersey. Um, I still live uh, and work from New Jersey. Uh, while I have my lovely coworkers here, I have three uh, pet, probably fur babies at home that are act as my coworkers on the day to day. Um, and why did I come to AARP? So I was in smaller nonprofit, mid-sized nonprofit, and then did a little stint in corporate social responsibility. Mm -hmm. And I, when I looked at ARP and saw the job uh, position open in New Jersey, it just seemed like the best of both worlds. Everything that I loved about the work I'd done in, in both spaces, which was that social impact, the volunteer engagement, a sprinkle of event planning, um, and really some of the advocacy and social mission work that we do. So that led me here and uh, continued on my way to, to OVE to pursue that passion of volunteers. Hey, sounds great. Tara. Oh, my goodness. Christina, you're such a big <laughs> <laughs> I came to AARP over 17 years ago, and it's so hard to believe that that much time has passed. Um, uh, prior to AARP, I was with um, the Alabama Department of Senior Services, and I was administering grants and specifically helping with the rollout of Medicare Part D. And that's um, that's why AARP chose me. But I will say the reason I came to AARP is because it was similar to Kathy in studying gerontology. I studied health services administration and kind of um, wove my way into long-term care and aging policy and things of that nature. And so 
um, you know, after leaving uh, or after several years with the department on aging, I was like, you know, what's next? Where, where do you go from here? And without a major shift in focus, it was like AARP is the only place to be. And that's what, you know, truly that's what keeps me here is that I can't imagine being anywhere else if I'm going to do this kind of work. Um, so I came to Tennessee where I still live. I'm in Nashville, uh, similar to Christina, to be community outreach director for um, the state of Tennessee. And um, that is one of the most robust roles in all of the association. Uh, you have to know a lot. So you can tell Christina in her short time knew so much when she interviewed for these, these positions that we said, wow, has she only been here four years? She knows everything. Um, and it's just really one of the most fun positions that you can hold as well. So uh, when people ask us, is this role better? I often say it's just different. You can't compare the two because <laughs> they are so different. Um, and I think that was it. I think that was the last question. I'll stop talking now. Hand, hand the mic back to you, Lillian. <laughs> I am going to hand the mic over to Judy. Okay, thank you all. Thank you, ladies, especially. What what great and diverse backgrounds you have. Well, let's get uh, go into uh, a little deeper dive into your role with AARP and what does the title of advisor mean? And what's a typical work day for all of you? I don't think the word typical work day <laughs> exists in our, in our position. Um, I will say uh, we all cover uh, two regions. So, um, you know, I'm for the large and west. So, you know, an average day might be, um, you know, meetings to strategize on volunteer engagement, whether it's recruitment to recognition with a state. Um, and then, you know, leading some of the work that we do at the um, overarching level for OVE, such as, you know, our DIY work um, or um, bolt work. So. I'd say an average day is a lot of talking to the, the states and seeing what they need from us and helping to problem solve. I like to say that I'm a treasure hunter as well as a thought partner for the state. So helping find those um, best practices that they might need, but also, um, you know, help them think about ways to reimagine or refine some of their volunteer engagement work. Yeah, I am, uh, so again, this is Tara, and I'm advisor for the South and Central regions, and um, one of the things that I often talk about with my states, because they're smaller in terms of the number of staff that they have, as well as the number of members that they're serving, is that it, you can feel like you're kind of all alone out there doing the work, mm -hmm. and so um, as as weird as the comment is, a thought partner has always made me roll my eyes to say that, <laughs> and then I, I catch myself saying there's no other way to describe what we do sometimes. It's really um, being a collaborative colleague, you know, being someone who understands the work and knows what you're experiencing and um, helping to think through some of those things. We are like a sounding board often uh, where someone says, I have this idea and I'm trying to pull it all together and I just want to run it by you and see what you think and what am I missing. Um, and I love that treasure hunter, Christina, because I always say, you know, if you're looking for more than just a few minutes for something, pitch it over to us. That's why we're here. Um, sometimes we can find it right away. Sometimes we do have to go on a little bit of a, a, a of a treasure hunt to be able to find what we're looking for. Um, but that really is one of the key roles that we can play so that folks can really stay focused on their work back home um, and not spend time getting frustrated with, you know, um, digging into the abyss. And I'd say um, ditto on, on the advisor role. My uh, states that I work with are in the mega region, which are the large seven, uh, largest seven states in the country, as well as the East of Caribbean region. And um, I think in addition to thought partner, one of the things that the three of us try to do is to walk the walk, if you will, in terms of some of our core fundamental ways that we talk with states, especially new staff. ARP is an elephant. I think we all know that. It's, it's like, there. which part of the elephant did you learn today? And if you think you understand it, just give it a few weeks because there'll be a new part you didn't even know existed. So, so some of it is that navigator role, but also demonstrating, uh, for example, volunteer and staff partnership is one of our core um, fundamental building blocks for what we talk about in terms of how ARP does volunteerism. And so when I work with a state, um, 
Uh, Rhode Island has, has had us come in a few weeks ago and talk with their group about co-leadership and why that was important as an example, because they wanna work on building co-leadership within their volunteer ranks uh, this year. And so I didn't go to that by myself because for a staff person to come in and talk about volunteer co-leadership doesn't quite meet the mark. So we work with um, a variety of volunteers and we make every effort to partner with volunteers whenever we work with the uh, staff. And I'm always so tickled when afterwards we get the comment, it was great to have you, Kathy, but wow, to have a volunteer stand up in front and partner with you and sort of lead the way and you just step back was the most powerful part of what happened, right? So we um, we do we act as treasure hunters, we connectors, leaders, strategize. We're often in the nitty and the gritty, let's be honest. Sometimes you just need some, please give me an answer. <laughs> okay, I got that. Um, and then we also work hard with our volunteer, amazing volunteer partners to to uh, work with the state. So that's a pleasure. Well, all of that sounds really great. And uh, Tara, you used a word that's coming up in my next um, question, I guess, is how do you all collaborate with each other? I know you're in different parts of the state. And of course, you know, we have the Zoom technique now and the telephones as always, but how do you collaborate with each other? I think that we would all agree we wish we could do even more than we do now in a probably in a more um, relaxed and like fun way. <laughs> but a lot of times our collaboration is, you know, reaching out to each other about uh, maybe a question that we receive from the state, um, a resource that we're looking for um, to try to pull in examples from outside the region or from someone who's most recently done a thing, whether that's mm -hmm. recruitment, whether that's an event and planning that event and creating volunteer roles, things of that nature. So we're often doing that. Um, and that often, unfortunately, happens by email or teams, right? It's mm -hmm. not the most, it's not like we're not sitting around drinking coffee around a bistro table, unfortunately, because um, that would be a whole lot, a whole lot more fun. Um, but one of the things that Christina mentioned uh, was that we work behind the scenes on some of the stuff that's our regular mm -hmm. work, stuff that is not often seen until it's like uh, a kind of fancy and uh, not necessarily flashy, but that it's well refined. So we are on a training and development team uh, within the Office of Volunteer Engagement. And so a lot of work happens before we get a finished product that we're able to bring out to folks in community. And uh, every Friday we have a meeting we call the Meat Grinder. <laughs> okay, I was wondering about that if you had a regularly scheduled meeting time. <laughs> yes, yeah, so we, uh, you know, we have a, mon a Monday staff meeting where we all get a chance to touch base, but on Fridays, um, it's it's a pretty lengthy meeting, and this has now been continuing for a couple of years, that mm -hmm. it is time we dedicate to not only having our team at the table, but also our volunteers that are collaborating with us on uh, creating the training and development resources that we um, are able to offer out to folks. And mm -hmm. so during that time, it is, as Kathy said, it is the nitty and the gritty, and there are some people who cannot tolerate it. <laughs> okay. I'm done. I got to leave for today. I can't handle it anymore. Um, and likewise, we've had, we've, no, no, we've had people who have said, I can't, uh, uh, wow, this is amazing. People would never know how much goes into working on this stuff before it comes out to something that we're able to offer up and we know is a quality product. And so um, that is just one of the examples of the way that we really come together to create something together. All right. Well, well Kathy, you've been there the longest. I think you said 20 years. Um, so when you're doing your collaboration, is it just with the three of you all or do you reach out to other departments in AARP? Yeah, thank you. I think that's also part of our advisor role is we, we represent the Office of Volunteer Engagement beyond our department. So we can get questions about the portal or questions about Create the Good or other things that ARP does. We get questions for each other. So I'll get somebody from asking questions about the DIY, the do-it-yourself okay. kits, and I'll check in with Christina. But we also collaborate. Um, we Each of the regions has what they call a matrix team, mm -hmm. which means different representatives sit around a virtual table who work with that particular region. So that includes folks from the advocacy world. It includes folks from the communications world, the research world. And so those meetings generally happen. In some cases, for me, it's weekly. Some other regions, it's quarterly or, or monthly. So we 
we have those regular times when we get together in addition to, you know, all of the electronic means for pinging people when you need them. <laughs> right. Okay, well, Christina, you know, you were saying, we were talking about collaboration and just to continue on that theme for an, another few minutes. Um, collaboration with other departments, but then I heard Kathy say that uh, she has different areas, if that's the correct word, like uh, create the good, or the portal, um, the votes. Do you all, are you separated in that area? Is this a difference in your job role and that each one of you are assigned a specific team to work with? Yeah, I, I think that we each have certain volunteer teams that we help partner with. Mm -hmm. um, however, I don't think that silos us necessarily. Okay. Like Kathy said, if you know, there's a question for a state on DIY, Kathy would still be the advisor, they would reach out to about it, and then we would make those connections. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, similarly, I think it's really important to keep that collaboration open, because, you know, I, I work with the large and West primarily, those are mm -hmm. two very different regions, right. for example. Uh, West is some of the smallest state offices in the country mm -hmm. and largest, you know, the second biggest. So if I didn't collaborate with, you know, Kathy, Tara, and all of our different departments, all of our different resources, mm -hmm. it would be a disservice to our state. So, you know, I think that we're, we're constantly trying to be cognizant of who we should bring into the conversation, mm -hmm. most importantly, volunteer voices, right, from the Office of Volunteer mm -hmm. Engagement, back to Kathy's point of, of walking the walk. You know, what volunteers need to be in that conversation? What state staff need to be in that conversation? Mm -hmm. Or what representatives from different groups that I might not be the lead of? But I'm, I know should have a voice in that work and what okay. we're doing. So I think we all have an intentionality around collaboration, specifically within the lens of, of volunteers. That sounds great because I know, um, so if I were on a particular team, I wouldn't necessarily have to go directly to you or I could, if I can't get up with you, I could always call Tara or Kathy and they are able to respond. So that's, that's great. That's great. I, I think something we like to say is a no wrong door approach, right? Okay, so you I like can, that. You can, go, you can go anywhere and we'll get you where you need to go. Okay, very good. Okay. I think the beauty of your, no, I was just going to, I was going to flip it to you actually, but to your point, Lily, and our job is really two, two different jobs that are overlap. And one of it is to work with the, uh, the states and the regions for our advisor role. But then we also have a number of, of areas of responsibility at the national office. It's more related to our kind of special projects or special teams. Okay. So Tara, I, I, why don't you talk about yours? Yeah, and it's kind of cool that uh, I would extend and say that now that we've become we've become so sophisticated during the pandemic, I feel like in the in our um, in our department because we were able to grow from about five volunteer teams in the Office of Volunteer Engagement to about fifteen wow. volunteer yeah. teams over the course of just a couple of years, and these teams are so integrated into the work that we do that it's also like you can reach out to one of the team leaders and they can usually get you to the right place and so right. that is a beautiful thing because it does mean that that's just more and more people who are able to access the resources mm -hmm. that we have uh, who feel that we welcome the questions and comments and you know assistance that they need um, and it also allows us, sometimes we're just assigned these things, right? <laughs> like you fall into it. Okay. But there are other times when it's something that you maybe have a, a special interest in, or maybe are uh, just particularly, you see a need and you're able to respond to it. And that's really what happened with the team development was that we saw needs, we were able to respond to them. Uh, but then there are other areas of our work that if we are uh, maybe like tapped to bring the volunteer engagement perspective to something like, rural, there was a whole work group that deals with rural within the uh, organization, um, and we bring that volunteer engagement component to it. So there's this kind of um, vibe that's also carrying through, and it goes back to what you were asking about the collaboration with other departments and really with people that are not our usual suspects on the day-to-day. -day. Okay. Well, it sounds as if you all have to be very flexible in your job roles, what you're doing. Um, what is that old saying, um, master of all, something of none? I don't even know how it goes. But anyway, it seems that uh, you all, as if you all uh, have a lot going on, and I hope that the volunteers and staff who are listening understand that, but also understand that uh, you all are there to collaborate 
in any area with them. So that's wonderful. That is so wonderful. Judy, I'm going to turn it back to you. Thank you. Um, great discussion, by the way. Very interesting. I'm, I'm being educated, too, as a volunteer. Yes. Um, one thing I would like to know is, uh, for example, within your state, say I'm um, a state staff person and I want to do something with my volunteers, if I want to reach out to you, how would that work? Say, you know, I'm in Illinois, and I want to reach out to my advisor about something. How does that work? Well, I'll, I'll start because Illinois is one of my states. <laughs> Just call me. Just okay. Call me. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, sometimes we uh, have regular meetings with state offices or state offices will say, hey, you know, join us for our regular monthly meeting and we'll, we'll just have a time. Uh, we also work very closely with our Office of Community Engagement mm -hmm. colleagues. So we call them our sister or brother department, depending on who you're talking with. But it's Women's History Month. So we'll call them our sister department. <laughs> right. And they often meet very regularly with the state staff, at least in the mega region. So uh, my colleague and I will hop on calls together and talk with um, state staff. So they know they'll see us periodically mm -hmm. at some of those check-ins. But other than that, they can they can email, call, Zoom, <laughs> whatever they like. Mm -hmm. And we are um, happy to be there in person. So, you know, we're back to in person. Thank goodness. And so we can parachute in uh, anytime uh, or we can be there virtually. And, and so we have, I think, a lot more states feeling like just pop in virtually, right? You That way we can grab you for 30 minutes and, you know, we don't feel like you're flying all the way out here for not a whole lot of time. So we are happy to do to do both of those things. So thank you. So call me, Judy, anytime. I will do that. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> And, and I'll just piggyback on on what Kathy said. I, I don't think, again, a no wrong door approach. I, you know, I when I work with the states, I say it could be Teams, it could be Zoom, it could be, you know, Outlook, just get a hold of me. Um, so, you know, I think we make ourselves available for those conversations as as often as states need. And it's really individualized to what that state needs. So to Kathy's point, there's some state staff that I'll have monthly one on ones with. Mm -hmm. And then there's some that I'll meet with at ad hoc as needed. Um, so it's really dependent on the needs. But I will say, you know, our role is to think about volunteer engagement 24 seven state mm -hmm. staff have a few more balls in the air. So that's when they can call us in to just be that kind of, you know, that person to bounce something off of if you have an idea. Um, and I'll say we also make ourselves available when applicable if a volunteer in that state has a question, a lead volunteer, right? It doesn't have to be limited just to the state staff as well. Excellent, thank you. Yeah, I think the, uh, I'll just add one one or two more things. You know, it's funny at looking back and thinking about how, um, what supports available to the states has really grown and expanded over time, specifically about seven-ish years ago, uh, when there were some additional um, roles added to state support. Um, it it sometimes feels like folks think they should that if they call us, they're in trouble, right? <laughs> and that's not, or, or if we call them just to check in that they're in trouble or that someone's told us to call. Mm -hmm. And it's not the case. It's it's truly, a lot of times if we're reaching out, it's out of curio curiosity or because we heard something that caught our attention. We said, tell me more. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, the folks who really take advantage of us proactively or when before they get too far down the road of frustration <laughs> or planning or even just I mean just in their day-to-day -day work um they I think get so much more you know like just the regular check-in of um and and saying you know is there anything I'm missing is there anything new maybe I you know they're now that we're back in person people are back on the road and that's one of the reasons we love the roost news because folks can listen on the go um i was just checking our stats yesterday and we're at 60 percent of the folks who are joining us through the audio only are listening on their um apple uh ipod uh, not ipod oh my gosh listen to me their podcast uh platform through apple and others are joining by desktop so um we have uh, listeners who are telling me things like 
I can now take a walk and find out what's going on in other states and what's going on in the world of volunteer engagement instead of sitting at my desk to eat my sandwich and thinking, what am I missing? I can relax and go take a walk with you guys. And that's that is such love an important to hear that, thing. Right, Judy? Right? Oh, we should all be taking a walk yeah. while we're doing this conversation. <laughs> okay. Definitely. Okay. Um, you know, as I think about everything that has been said, it's wonderful. And Tara must be reading my mind because she <laughs> is leading me to my next question or topic of uh, concern, not concern, that's not a good word, because of interest. And that is, since the Roost News is sharing information, what's the hot topic now? What are you all uh, thinking about uh, a trend to have something going on or hot topics, trends? whichever word you want to use for it, what are they? I'll jump in with one for me that I wanted to be sure to mention while we're here together, which okay. is one of our, our focus areas for the Office of Volunteer Engagement is to expand the numbers of diverse volunteers at ARP. And by diversity, we mean all kinds of diversity, right? From race, mm -hmm. religion, and orientation, et cetera. So uh, to get there, part of what we've developed volunteer initiated uh, at, in the Office of Volunteer Engagement is a training. So we have a diversity training for volunteers mm -hmm. that we say is not your grandfather's or grandmother's diversity training. It is a volunteer led um, and it's a series. You can take just the first one if that's all your group wants to do. That's that's great. Right. And it's volunteer led and it's called Becoming a More Inclusive Volunteer. And it really focuses on how are we as an organization making every volunteer feel that they belong? And if they're new, uh, what are we doing to make sure that they feel welcome in the room and really, really being conscious of things we may or may not know that we do, right? Some that, some that are positive, some that may not be so positive. And the volunteers that have taken the course have really felt like they can turn around and apply that to their everyday volunteer world, but also to their, their personal world. So I just want to put a plug in for that, that session and that um, it's, it's a series of five and, and we've got some volunteer teams who have signed up for all five, which is wonderful, but our, our focus is really the first one. And in addition, we have um, this year a special focus on Hispanic Latino outreach, in particular looking for uh, volunteers to volunteer with ARP that are Spanish speaking and what do we need to do as an organization? And to be honest, we need to do a lot better uh, to not only recruit those volunteers, but make sure that we have things in language for them and a wide variety of ways for them to educate and reach out to the Spanish speaking population. So we have um, some pilots going on this year and we also have a monthly, just started this week actually, a monthly coffee, uh, coffee uh, get together, cafecito get together with uh, volunteers and staff to talk about what they're already doing in their states, because this is what we find, right? Somebody has an idea and they think nobody else has ever done it. And they get on one of these calls and find out three other people have done it. We have something we can share and you can see what we did. So it's a wonderful way to start any kind of collaborative effort. So thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, well, is that going on in each of the regions or just certain regions at this time? The Cafecito is a national um, call. It's open to everybody once a month if they're mm -hmm. interested in joining. Mm -hmm. So AARP's involvement or role in that, is that you said you had something going on in your region, I believe, a pilot? So, yeah, there are, uh, pi this, is all this is all within AARP and the Office of Volunteer Engagement. So there is a Hispanic Latino pilot this year. Mm -hmm. And the learnings from those three pilot sites will be brought to that monthly cafecito so that even states that are not involved in the, the pilot um, can can share what is being learned from the pilot. And as a result of all that, we hope we've figured out some ways what, by the end of the year that more states can take advantage of recruiting and engaging Hispanic Latino volunteers. Well, Kathy, to your first point, I am so excited to say that uh, we interviewed one of the um, co-leads for the Becoming a More Inclusive Volunteer. And so those listening today, listen to what Kathy just said. And if you want to hear a little bit more, listen to that podcast. It's out there and we hope you will listen to it. Okay, I think um, I'll turn it back over to... Could I, Louie, really, I'll just, Christina, yeah, okay. I'll jump in with one more trending oh, please, please. topic right now, yes. which is... Um, 
growth and growth, not just meaning uh, numbers, right? Growth in depth of our volunteer activities, okay. growth in terms of recruitment. Yes, mm -hmm. the traditional sense of growth. And, you know, really, we're in a different environment for mm -hmm. our state offices than we were pre-pandemic, right? We're mm -hmm. in this environment where we have virtual work, we have in-person work, and we have um, more, we have uh, less capacity, I think, than we did previously. So, you know, looking at where we can um, refine our work and come up with recruitment strategies that will help fill those gaps and, and help states move forward. So we really outlined a process here in the Office of Volunteer Engagement, which we're calling Plow Plant Prosper, which goes into everything you need to think about prior to recruitment, what you need to think about during recruit, during uh, the actual tactical pieces, and then how to prosper after you facilitated all of that. And so we have a recruitment clinic opportunity that state staff and lead volunteers are invited to if they want um, some assistance with some strategic thinking as they go through those growth stages, mm -hmm. um, which has been you know really exciting. We're seeing a lot of recruitment events happening right now um, that are um, just successful and seeing some really great movement in this space across the regions. Um, and then I'll just also touch briefly on um, the rural work. You know, we're looking at ways that we can deepen our impact in some of our rural communities where we can't have the traditional ARP volunteer team, but we still want to have some activation of volunteers in those areas and representation across the state. So we're trying some pilot projects this year as well around deepening um, the opportunities for rural volunteers as well. Great. And I'll just add that we have had a lot of um, turnover in staff as well as volunteers um, during this uh, the last couple of years for a variety of reasons, right? Um, people have really taken a step back and taken a look at their lives and decided um, to make some changes in many cases to um, just better suit where they'd like to go in the future. And because of that, we have a lot of new people on board. And so one of the most important things that's coming up soon is that we'll be offering our Letting Go course, which uh, is, has been rebranded as Inviting Volunteers into Leadership. <laughs> Um, and it's like the introduction to volunteer engagement at AARP. And so as we've talked about um, throughout our chat today, um, we do things differently at AARP. I mean, <laughs> yes, volunteers are volunteers uh, in many ways, but um, we are fortunate that when volunteers come to AARP and decide we're a good place to spend their time, they stay with us for 15 years, 20 years. It's um, not uncommon and it's because of that partnership angle. And so um, it's also partially because of that approach, right? We're not, um, we're not just uh, sitting at a desk giving people directions <laughs> every day, uh, just as uh, our day-to-day -day varies, so do the, those day-to-days of our volunteers in the field. And so um, that's going to be an important invitation coming up, but it's also something that's available on the volunteer portal. So if yes. someone listening is just interested, you can find uh, under the training tab, inviting volunteers into leadership. And it's a self-paced learning. Um, it's something that we worked really hard to create and uh, in those meat grinder sessions. So you can see mm -hmm. the end result of that. Um, and it is uh, not your standard um, compliance type training. We promise mm -hmm. it's a little bit fun, a little bit ridiculous <laughs> to make it a little more memorable. So right. um, you can definitely go and check that out. Yes, yes, I've experienced that and it is uh, memorable. Yes, yes. From the chicken to the, I'm looking up there, I have the egg and the chicken above up here. I loved it. But, <laughs> but back to the hot topic, there's what I want to ask you about. Um, I've heard a lot about digital divide uh, digital equity. Is that anything um, that AARP is approaching, addressing? My, um, in my experience with my states, typically that's addressed on two different places. One is in our state advocacy work. So the types of um, volunteerism that volunteers get involved in are, as you know, the, the broad gamut and a good number of states have um, advocacy work going on around the digital divide and, mm -hmm. and broadband. And the other is in the area of livable communities. And yes. sometimes that's, um, that's partnerships with organizations that are helping to provide uh, training or even computers and through grants, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's education. And I know our, our programs uh, group also offers education efforts. So 
Um, to me, that's it's one of those uh, can vary by every state, but yeah. without a doubt is a really important issue. You can't do anything anymore without somebody saying go online. And uh, so as we, you know, we look at ARP as an organization, we look at our membership and where there really needs to be additional work. And that's that's clearly a place the organization is focused. Others? Uh, and I'll just plug in, ARP recently brought on a wonderful affiliate of OATS, um, yes. Older Adult Technology mm -hmm. Services, and uh, public, internally known as OATS, <laughs> externally known as Senior Planet, yeah. uh, to help really address some of those, those di digital divide issues in the states. Um, and so they're ramping up their work. I know AR it's a very important um, association within ARP scope. So we're really excited, I know, as an organization to have them as an affiliate. Right. And to bring it back around to our work and what um, resulted as a, a, a seeing a need in our volunteer forces was that we have a technology training team that serves our volunteers. Mm -hmm. and <laughs> definitely um, created to help serve our volunteers who yes. are saying, I need a little bit more help with what's going on in the virtual space with my volunteer work. And so um, that's going to be expanding this year as well. We've done basic training, but they're changing um, up their offerings a bit. They are continuing with their popular Tech Tuesdays, mm -hmm. but they're also going to be working on helping folks create a technical support teams that can help mm -hmm. with these virtual events that states are having. Um, they're really excited about that. It's a need that we weren't sure would pers persist after uh, we started to go back in person. And mm -hmm. uh, what we found is that we need it more than ever because people are being pulled in a lot of different mm -hmm. directions. So um, having the access to um, the training that's specialized with the way we use these tools like Zoom, as well as having someone that folks can call just to maybe run through the settings because they're nervous about their first presentation, <laughs> you know, is very different than what someone gets from attending a, a thousand person training where they might not even get a chance to ask their specific question. So we um, try our best to provide support to our volunteers for the technology that we use and the technology we provide. And then of course, for our leadership volunteers, we wanna make sure they have the tools that they need to do the work, right? So you guys know as volunteer leaders, uh, that's one of the first questions that I ask you is, would it be helpful for your work with all this stuff we're gonna be doing, maybe to have a device that makes it easy for you to record a podcast, you know? <laughs> yes. whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. um, so we do our best to remove any kind of obstacles or barriers to um, full participation with us. Um, sometimes, unfortunately, that's not possible because it, it's got to be a system issue, right? Like broadband. Right. But a lot of times it's a really easy thing that we can say yes to in order to help make it um, easier for folks to step in to those places of discomfort and, and get a better feeling for it as they kind of move along uh, their volunteer journey. Great, great. I'll turn it back over to Judy. Thank you. Um, a, a little bit of a follow-up uh, for all three of you, uh, Kathy, Tara, and Christina. You're talking about some new programs, uh, pilot programs, Christina, you were talking about reaching out to the rural area, and even with the tech, Tara, um, besides this podcast that people will hear about all these things, how are you promoting, promoting it, so to speak, to your district, to your area? So we're very fortunate that we have um, a communication that goes out to volunteer leadership, which is still, it's a pretty robust group of people. Um, we call that the OVE update, and it comes out every two weeks. There's a lot of, I mean, it is just uh, information packed, and we have volunteers now saying, you know, if you're not reading that update, you're missing out. <laughs> uh, but oftentimes there's a trickle down effect from what we send out to then states are putting it in their newsletters or their communications with their volunteers. Um, and then we have volunteers who are such great ambassadors for like, cross promoting things that are going on. So our volunteer fast track, which is an onboarding and orientation team uh, from a national perspective, does a great job of referring people to some of these other resources. Um, they are often involved in multiple projects. So they're, it's easy for them to do a little uh, shameless plug at the end of a session or when a question comes up. Um, those are probably the, the top ways that folks find out about what we're doing. Um, and for those who are on the volunteer portal, that all 
volunteer chatter feed is a gem. It's been great for us to be able to identify new volunteers that want to work with us on some of these special projects we're talking about um, and in some of these teams. But it's also a great way to stay on top of what's going on because that uh, really does elevate the messages that are relevant to the, the larger um, you know, group of volunteers rather than just some of the specific areas that folks may be working in. Okay, great. And I would just add to that, um, it's part of the elephant concept, which is, as, as one of my colleagues mentioned, if you're, an, if you're a staff person, everybody in the sun's trying to communicate with you, right? We're one group. <laughs> you might be getting five <laughs> newsletters. So even though our, our update has all kinds of gold in it, you may or may not have seen it this week, right? So, <laughs> so I think part of our role of advisors is when we talk to folks, being able to you know, is the gold, the, the treasure hunters of the library, and we walk over to the stacks and pick out the one book that you, <laughs> you might be interested in, and we, and we get it to you, because we know that there's just, there's a lot of great information, there are a lot of great resources, and to be honest, there's just a lot, and so part of it is how we kind of uh, serve in that role as treasure hunter, too. Before we conclude, do you have anything else that we haven't asked you that you feel that you just want to make sure everybody knows about? I'll probably think of 700 things after <laughs> this. <laughs> but right now, I, I, think, I think I've covered my the things that were rattling in my brain. Great. Anyone else want to add anything? I would just put in a plug for um, one of the other philosophies we have, which is to invite volunteers in early when you really don't know what you're doing. And it's so tempting to say, um, you know, let me get it all together and then call a volunteer because I don't want to waste their time. And that can be tempting for staff, but it can also be tempting for volunteer leaders to say, right? So we, we, have made a real effort and it is a learning <laughs> to to say I don't know what I'm doing yet so I guess it's time to call a meeting and you know grab some folks and see if we can figure it out together and this roost news group is is one of the examples of that right so volunteers had this idea and I want to just bow to, to Tara for a moment Tara is my role model for <laughs> I don't know, let's get together and talk about it. I'm sure we can figure it out. And it just moves forward. And so it, it, we've we've done that and we've helped each other to do it because it is very tempting to drop back to, let me get it together first. So I wanna thank you all uh, for for this opportunity and for, and for demonstrating <laughs> exactly what we're talking about because uh, we just showed up here. You, you gave us the questions, you gave us all the interaction we needed and said, this is the time, show up. We didn't do any other prep with this. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Yeah. I'll, I'll also, I would be remiss if I didn't mention as well that in two days it is National Volunteer Month. Um, mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, just a big uh, hats off to all of our volunteers. Uh, like Kathy said, thank you both so much for having us today. Um, but, you know, we know that it's going to be an important month to recognize and acknowledge all of the volunteer work happening um, across the country, both in AARP and, and um, just in general. So thank you both. And uh, just excited for the month to come. Well, thank you all so very much. I know I asked a couple of questions that were not listed, but I did it for a reason because I wanted to see what you would say. No, I knew you would have the answers. And it, it's so wonderful to hear that you all collaborate with each other because that is important for AARP. There's so much going on. I've heard volunteers say, oh my gosh, I get so many emails and how do I filter this information? Um, so volunteers and staff listening today, please share with other staff and volunteers the importance of listening to this particular podcast because you have three women, three leaders in AARP who have given you a massive amount of information that can support your role as a volunteer and as a staff. So please listen. We appreciate you listening today. Uh, we thank you for your support and we'll ask you to stay tuned for our next podcast. Have a good evening. Thank you.